Welcome to Film Detour, a podcast where two longtime film buddies take you down and around the back alleys and side streets of cinema. With the occasional left-hand turn. I'm John Knappen. And I'm Bob Muller. So let's go. John, you ready? I'm ready. Let's hit it. So this is a 20th Century Fox film shot at Shepperton Studios. It's brilliant. It's The Innocence, uh, 1961, directed by Jack Clayton, who is a great English director. Lots of great stuff. A lot of producing, though. He did a lot, yeah. mostly producing. He directed yeah. some films, but this is really his first film, to the best of my knowledge, that he directed. No, he did one before this. Did he? he? Okay. Room at the Top with Lawrence Harvey yes. and Simone Sinaret. Sinaret. Sin- Another interesting adult film. He also did The Great Gatsby. Believe it or not, with Robert Redford and Mia Farrow. He didn't direct that. Yeah. He directed that? He directed that. I did not know that. Uh, Written by Francis Ford Coppola. Right. Coppola said he used all the wrong lenses. (laughs) He did did say that. uh, Because it didn't go over very well. I mean, he did a lot of stuff. Another one he did... Something Wicked This Way Comes. Unfortunately, that's one of my favorite all-time books. Yeah. Ray Bradbury. It's a magnificent book, but it just does not translate... To the screen. I I have to say that Jason Robards is perfect. So this film does have a bunch of heavy hitters. I'll just start with cinematography. Mm -hmm. Freddie Francis. Freddie Francis. Um, He was also a well-known director. After a period of time, he became a director doing a lot of the Amicus films. Yeah, like some of his early films were Saturday Night and Sunday Morning. You ever see that? I did not see that. That's a great English kind of kitchen sink drama. He shot The Elephant Man. Yeah, and that's what makes it look amazing. It looks so beautiful in black and white. Dune, another film for David Lynch, surprisingly. He shot the theatrical version of Dune, you're right. <laughs> and French Lieutenant's Women. That's uh, a beautiful film. Yeah. I, I for, totally forgot he did that. And he won an Oscar for Glory. Talk about a spanning career of so many decades. That's really amazing. <laughs> Interestingly, all these movies, and he even won an Oscar for Glory, he did consider The Innocence one of his favorite films. You take a look at this movie, every frame is beautiful. And I have to say that Jack Clayton's eye... For setting shots up and moving the camera, oh my God! Yeah. So this guy produced a lot of stuff. And he certainly was keeping an eye on what what to do and how to do it. Yeah. But he did a beautiful job directing. This. I mean, the original Henry story James is from Henry James. Turn of the Screw. Turn of the Screw. Right. Jack Clayton read that as a as a young person and loved always loved this story. Always wanted to do it. So it must have been brewing in his head for a long time. But he totally nails it. So again, as we said, this is an adaptation of Turn of the Screw, written by William Archibald and Truman Capote. Wow, right? Like out of nowhere. And the interesting um, thing is, and I, I I can't say you know I can't take a pair of tweezers and just go okay, this was Capote's thing too. But there are certain eerie elements and some sorted elements that I have a funny feeling that Truman Capote had something to do with. Well, the original writer was William Archibald because he wrote a theater piece, a a play based on, which was actually popular, I think, based on Turn of the Screw. But they brought in Capote, I think, because they needed help with the dialogue. When I think of Truman Capote, I automatically think of In Cold Blood. Right. And for a period of time, I lived out in rural Kansas. Yeah. And I, I, made the yeah. mis- I made the mistake of, 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 of watching that movie with my wife one night. We're out in the middle of nowhere. And I thought, this is a really stupid idea. <laughs> that is a scary movie. It's chilling. Yes. It's chilling. And, and the way Capote can do that sort of thing with his writing, right. he totally does it in this film. Well, apparently he was writing the book at the same time. And he took a three-week break. To work on this film. You're kidding. Because so, he did work for years on that book. It wasn't like a quick thing. Sure. So it did happen simultaneously. Well, I'm telling you, the feeling I got watching yeah. In Cold Blood, you get that same up the back of your neck, you know, yeah. into your spine, chills. Yeah. So let's just go uh, step back a little bit. The cinematography, Freddie Francis shot it. It's in Cinemascope. It's a widescreen black and white film. And Clayton's eye yeah. to fill up that scene, mise en scène, as the French say. Yes. Every inch of that widescreen frame yeah. is filled with stuff that should be there. And I've seen this movie several times. Yeah. And every time I watch it, John, I see more stuff. Yeah. And I feel more stuff and I hear more stuff. It's really, it's so, it's like an onion. It's multi layered. It's got stuff packed in this. Right. Some of the night, certainly in the night scenes, they did want to close the frame in so freddie francis hand painted the edges of the frame the effect was it darkened the edges of the film and you can see it in some night scenes so that 
it's like they're surrounded by darkness in certain areas. And the music. The, the music is by a French composer. His name is George Auric. He did Cocteau's Beauty and the Beast, and he did Wages of Fear and Moulin Rouge, just to name three. He had a long, long career. And, and the, the music is so haunting in this movie. We got, we got Deborah Carr. Such a great actress. Yeah. In tons of films, we can't even begin to, to name them all. But From Here to Eternity right. with Burt Lancaster. Right. Heaven Knows Mr. Allison. And uh, what else? Black Narcissus. It's a Michael Powell. Right. Pressburger film. We have Peter, Peter Wingrade, who plays Peter Quint. Yes. Which we'll get to as, 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 as time goes on. Martin Stevens as Miles. Oh, oh my two, God. Okay, so this movie has two young kids in it. I mean, really, I've, I've never seen such incredible... Bill Mumumi from uh, from Lost in Space and, and, and the Twilight Zone stuff, he was a kid who always could get under my skin. Right. These two kids are unbelievable. So as you said, Martin Stevens is Miles. Uh, I, he didn't really have a big film career. The one film he did before this? Village of the Damned. <laughs> Again, Perfect casting. This kid is so great. His face is so classic. There's something about him. He can do so much with his face, and he's yeah. really creepy when he wants to be. Yes. And then, of course, Flora, the, uh, the his sister in the movie. Pamela Franken. The great Pamela Franken. She's fantastic. This is her first movie. And she went on to some great films, Prime of Miss Jean Brody, and another great horror film she's in, The Legend of Hell House. Yes. Roddy McDowell. Yeah. So the thing about Pamela Franklin is you will, all of you will recognize her as an adult. This is her first role. She's a young kid. She was in a lot of TV. She was born to act because when you see her in this movie, you can't believe these kids are acting. Mrs. Gross is Megs Jenkins, and she's terrific, too. I love Mrs. Gross in this movie. The word to use for this movie is subtlety. Just the way they shoot it, it takes place at this remote mansion out in the countryside, There's only four cast members, basically, uh, living cast members. The governess, Mrs. uh, Ms. Giddens, the housekeeper. Mrs. Gross. And the two children, Flora and Miles. Right. And um, that's pretty much it. Okay, so the movie starts out. Well, actually, before the movie starts out, you you have a black screen and you have this little folk tune, A Willow Will I. And it's this song about lost love. It just gets right under your skin. I saw this when I was about eight years old with my brother, and we were home by ourselves. My, my brother is not affected by horror movies. In fact, he says he even likes a good nightmare. So, you know, <laughs> you have this black background and this little girl singing this song, and it's just haunting. I mean, as a kid, your ears just prick up and your your, your attention's immediately grabbed. Yeah. And the singing kind of goes away, and then you hear these natural sounds, like birds chirping. Birds chirping, exactly. Kind of breeze. And I think the effect of all this is to kind of isolate you. One of the points of the movie is these people are isolated way out in the countryside. This woman's praying. What does she say? All I want to do is save the children. And this is the whole Because setup. the praying hands right now, we're in the midst of something right. that's really not good. No. So we're no. going back to the beginning. See, I'm yeah. just getting chills talking about this now, Joe, because this <laughs> movie really got into my skin. And, and then we cut back to this wealthy bachelor. The rich uncle who is, mm-hmm. uh, he inherited them, quote unquote, two orphan children, he calls them. Yes. Uh, Miles and Flora. He's in the process of hiring a governess, and the person is Deborah Carr, who who is Miss Giddens. You can tell she's a spinster. She's older. She's not married. She's a parson's daughter. And she's quite taken by this, this quintessential wealthy bachelor. You know, he's dashing. And he wants nothing to do with these kids. He's basically putting them in her hands and saying, do not contact me. You know, I want nothing to do with it. You're in charge. So he wants he wants her to, to take care of these two kids uh, out at his uh, large country estate uh, because the previous governess has just recently died. So, yeah, she's told about Miss Jessel, the governess has died, but she's also told not to broach this with the children. Especially Flora the girl, because yes. Flora is very attached to her. Yes. So she's to go off to this estate. It's called Bly. And to me, it's also a character in this film. The, the way this house is situated, it's just like out in the remote countryside. And if you can just imagine back in the 1800s, you're sent by horse-drawn carriage out to the country. The middle of nowhere. The middle 
middle of nowhere. <laughs> and it's just this creepy, And this is a large estate, man. It's a creepy old mansion out in the middle yeah. of nowhere. And it has all these different corridors and these creepy, twisted staircases that lead certain back ways to places. And, and, and it's, it's all these, once again, these dark shadows. Yeah. Kind of weird sculpture. The sculpture is very creepy. I, yeah. I, want, I want to comment that well, on a little bit later on. But I, yeah. yes, the, the, the sculpture just, is unnerving and it's all over the place. And the point, Inside the house right. and on the ground. So back to my point, this house just has a character of its Absolutely. own. Absolutely. And when she first gets there, she, she wants to walk. She gets she gets out of the coach. She right. says, can I please walk? So she's walking around and she's got her, you know, her beautiful garments of the day, the big hoop skirt and whatnot. Yeah. At one point, she's looking off. She's looking off this this beautiful lake, yeah. and there are, there are lilies, uh, pond lilies, and whatnot, and all this greenery around. And then you hear this little chilling sound. Uh, it's not quite a sound effect. I think it was more like music, but there's some f- foreboding quality to it. Yeah. And then you hear this woman's voice calling for this little girl's Flora, Flora, Flora. <laughs> yeah. And, and you're nowhere. thinking, and you're thinking, well, who's calling this girl? So yeah. suddenly, this girl appears yeah. in a so reflection see- in the pool of water in the yes. lake, and it, it's it's kind of ghostly because you're, yeah. you're you're not seeing her straight on; you're seeing her reflected in the pool of yeah. water. Miss Giddens says, "You must be Flora," and she says, "She says yes," and she said, "I heard someone calling you." Yes, and Flora says, "No one was calling me." Right away, you start to think. There's something going on here yeah. that nobody's telling anybody about. Certainly the kids are not telling the governess about. So it's weird that she doesn't, Flora doesn't admit to hearing the voice because literally she was right there. So Ms. Giddens and Flora walk back to the estate and they get to the house. And we and, meet Mrs. Gross, who's the housekeeper. Meet, she's she's the typical English kind of working class servant. She never really speaks above her station, She's always agreeable. Well, she has this quality, and it reminds me of the generation of, say, my parents and the, and my grandparents. Yeah. You never really talk about things. Yeah. It wasn't right to talk about these things. You just don't bother with that. It'll all go away. And that's how Mrs. Gross is. Yeah. So we get to the house, and right away, Miss Giddens is taken with the beauty of the house. Right. She even, like, it's like much better than she expected, I right. think she even mentions. Right. And Flora is just the most charming little girl, like all creepy kids in horror films. Once again, Flora says something along the lines of, Miles is coming, Miles is coming. And Miss Giddens looks at her and says, that's not really possible because he's at school. And Flora laughs and and as if she knows something that somebody else doesn't know. Shortly after that, here comes a letter. In the mail right, to her, right. forwarded from the uncle, who doesn't want to look at the piece of mail, just forwards <laughs> it right to her. I have nothing to do with this. It's from Miles' school. Yes. And we see Flora smile as if she knows what's in the letter already. And Mrs. Miss Giddens opens up the letter and realizes that Miles has been expelled from school, that yes. he is actually coming home. And we see a smile on Flora's face. Right. And Miss Giddens looks to her and says, you said something about <laughs> yes. Miles coming home. Did you know something about this? And all she does is smile. Flora. Right. All Flora does is smile. And she's watching this butterfly flitting about. But what's really happening is a spider is eating the <laughs> butterfly. She just says, it's a lovely spider and it's eating a butterfly. <laughs> but she's totally ignoring Miss Giddens' yes. question about yeah. how did you know about Miles coming home? Isn't that so deceptive? It's like you can tell she's kind of... A, she knows. Whether she does or not, but she plays it off. And what's also cool about that scene is Miss Giddens, you know, she's quite taken by the language in this letter. The letter basically says it's impossible to keep him and he's an injury to the others. The whole idea of this story is what is going on? Is it in this this repressed spinster's mind or is it real? So you can take you can make a case for both in this movie. It's so right. well done. Right. And already 
she's kind of formulating ideas about these kids based on information she sees and she gets. And this, like, how is this, how is a boy an injury to others? She's quite taken with this. But she seems to look to the better in these kids and say, something's wrong. That doesn't make sense. These are good kids. I love the scene when Mrs. Giddens and Mrs. Gross are in the greenhouse and they're talking about Miles being expelled from school, which... Mrs. Gross basically has her same point of view about everything, stuff and nonsense. That can't be possible. Master Miles wouldn't do a thing like that. And they're talking about what exactly is going on here with Miles. There's a shot where we have Mrs. Giddens on one side yes. and, and, Miss, and, and, and Mrs. Gross on the other side. And right in between them, there's this tortured statue. Yeah. He's he's bound in chains and he's twisted and tortured and this is how the statues give this really creepy yeah. overall feeling. All these statues look like there's something wrong with them. It's like a bad memory yes. or something. That's a very good way of looking. I like <laughs> I like that John. I didn't think of it that way. I like, like the that. house is just like maybe these statues have been in that house too long that they're really <laughs> getting contorted and tortured. That scene in the greenhouse is one long continuous dolly. Yep. It goes from one of those characters to the other. Whoever's talking, uh, I think one point Flora walks out a door and she comes around back into the greenhouse. It's it's really well choreographed. Jack Clayton does that a lot in the movie yeah. where you have somebody in the foreground yeah. and you have somebody in the background. And it reminds me of Greg Tolan's right. uh, cinematography right. from Citizen Kane where you have those lenses that have that deep focus where you have this person really close to the lens and they're really crisp and the person to the back, yeah. you can see it. But as they move, somebody moves to the back a little bit more, you're watching the face of the person who's up front. You're getting right. all the dots. Dialogue, but you're you're keying in on what the reaction is. It's yeah. really beautifully yeah, yeah. done. And then Miles comes home. They meet him at the station, right? right? He's he pulls up and he hands her flowers, right? Like the little gentleman Very brings good her point. flowers. Yes, it's like the seduction begins. He basically before you know anybody can get mad at you, you you give him some flowers <laughs> and say, hey, look, a butterfly. <laughs> you know? So you just you just do a little sleight of hand with some flowers. If he would have pulled them out of his sleeve, that would have been even better. <laughs> so he, she questions him in a very nice, loving manner about, um, oh, Miles, what exactly happened at school? And he says things like, it's so good to be home. <laughs> and she keeps pressing him, not hard, but pressing him, asking these questions. And he just stares out at the scenery and smiles. Yeah. And he ignores her, just like Flora did when she was watching the, the spider devour the butterfly. Um, but she does say to Ms. Gross, when she sees her, charm seems to run in the family. Like she's already taken with him. Right. Like he's won her over with his charm. Yes. The next scene is is one scene that is burned into my brain that I will never forget as well. And what's interesting about this film as a film, the horror does not only happen in the dark of night. Right. It happens in the bright sunshine of day. Miss Giddens is out in the garden. I think she might be in the near the greenhouse she's or taking something. The she's airs. out in the garden. She's and walking, she's yeah. got some scissors. She's going to cut some flowers. And she looks up. And in the bright sunlight like of day, there's glare that, that comes down. So you're looking at the sun and this this image of this person, this man, walking at the top of this tower. It looks like a medieval castle. Like a ra- the, the ramparts. Right. You can't quite see it because of the way it's it's the sun is hitting your eyes and it's her point of view shot. And you see the man walk. And he looks down at her and he just stares at her. Yeah. And that image to me is one of those images, it's again, so that scared the hell tough. out of me because it's the light of day. Yeah. This is not spooky, scary mm. shadows and dark. This is bright sunshine in the day. And she goes she goes upstairs. She runs to the, the, to the tower and she finds the door that'll let her in. And she opens it up and you hear the sound. You were talking about natural sound yeah. before. Tons Sorry. of flies. And what that, what that conjured up in me is decay. Yeah. Death. Right. 
you know, there, 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 there are all these flies in this dead area. This, this room hasn't been open for a long time. What's going on here? And it's very creepy to have that feeling of those flies flying in around there. So it feels like death. Yeah. And then she goes up this stairway and makes her way up, makes her way up, makes her way up. And she opens the door to go outside to, to this top of this tower. And she sees Miles, the boy. She runs around the tower. Because she's looking for this guy. Right. And th- she comes across Miles, who's sitting on the ground. And she says, Miles, tower. who is that man up here? And he said, I've been quite alone. Yeah. Once again, the chills go up your spine because you go, no, yeah. there was a guy there. Why are you lying about this? What? what well, who the, is this guy? I just have to go. The thing about the scene is, like, as you said, it's her point of view when she looks up at the tower. Yeah. The sun is in your eyes. Yeah. It's behind him. So yeah. he's almost a shadow, right, really. Right, right. And you see he, him kind of moving. He's silhouetted, but you can still yeah. see his eyes. Oh, yeah, yeah. And But just prior to that. We hear, as she's in the garden, after she sees the statue, suddenly the, it goes quiet and you hear Flora or somebody humming that freaking tune again. I'm serious. And again, as soon as you hear that tune, you know something's happening. When she looks up at the tower, she kind of sees the guy and these birds, pigeons, start fluttering yes. in slow motion, kind of. And then she kind of closes it's her eyes. It's disorienting to her. Did yeah. she really see this thing? But she closes her eyes because of the glare, and then when she opens them, he's gone. Right. So again, there's this weird kind of feeling like, what are we seeing? It's First of all, you're scared shitless as a kid when you see this. And we're going to keep referring to ourselves <laughs> as kids. Because I have to say, Bob was talking about this earlier, and I've seen it several times as a kid, because it was always on TV. One time I was at my aunt's house. I swear to God, things are going on and somebody had the tv on in the living room and i look up and it's the scene of her in the garden and of course it was that scene it was just like (laughs) it had to be that scene. there were images that stick with you it just like froze me (laughs) mid stride i was like who put that on like turn that off of all the tv shows to put on it's like in the middle of the day i don't want to see this right now (laughs) ever again (laughs) and then the next scene is we're going to jump a little, I guess, but the next scene is this great hide-and-seek scene. The kids want to play hide-and-seek, and they're going to run off first. So she goes roaming the house looking for these kids. Again, it's a great sequence because you do get to see the house. Like, I don't know how many sets they built, but she is basically all these beautiful little hallways and nooks. She's looking here or there, and suddenly she gets to this hallway, and it's dark at the end of the hallway, and she's walking down, and she suddenly stops... Things go quiet, and she looks. You kind of see the shadow across the hallway at the very end of the hallway. It's kind of like a woman with an outline of a dress, but you don't quite see it. With the same kind of that that hoop dress of the time. Yeah. And she's all dressed in black. And she just kind of floats across the hallway. Across the hallway, and then she's gone. And she's gone. And you cut back. It's a really wonderfully edited sequence. As in everything in this movie... It's not like they throw it in your face. Like, it's a quick shot, and then you cut back to her face, and then you see it again, and you cut back to her. And it's almost like yourself. But but it's not like a ghost, per se, because it's three-dimensional. It just looks like a person just floated across the hallway but it's in shadow and and then by the time you cut back to her it's so fast you you, you're questioning she's not even she's not even sure yeah Yeah, you're like what what did i just see then she ends up in the attic because she hears laughter up there right of she, course, when she opens the door, she has to see this little kind of wobbly, <laughs> a, a bobblehead clown yes. tick-tocking back and forth. I mean, it felt very Twilight zone when I saw that. And of course, when I see a, a clown in an attic, yeah. I'm going to stay, no. right? No. It's nodding its head, clicking back and forth. I'm gone. So she starts creeping around this, this attic because she's heard voices. She thinks it's the kids. Mm-hmm. And she comes across this little chest, right? Mm-hmm. And a music box. And she opens the music box. Well, she knocks it. She knocks it off onto the floor oh. by accident. And is that we hear the tune then? Yes. That, then, so then, then the music the, box engages. And this is the tune we've been hearing, Flora hum, and we heard at the beginning. And inside the music box, very important, is a photograph. And, and the glass is broken across the face. And, and we, we kind of see this face. I always thought he looked like Anthony Quinn, a young Anthony Quinn. But it's this little portrait of this guy. I'm just going to say this is important, that she sees this photo. Why is it important, John? We'll talk about it later <laughs> on. So suddenly Miles, behind her, out of the attic, he just comes running up on her. Right. He surprises her. Right. And he grabs her around the neck. And he's like a little You're kid. You're my prisoner. You're my says. prisoner. And he's like so excited. He's like happy. He's laughing. And like little kids, they get carried away. 
And he starts great. He's from behind. He's got her on the neck and he starts choking. And she says, you're hurting me. Stop. You're You're hurting hurting me. And he's squeezing. He doesn't hear her. And harder. He's like a little puppy almost. He doesn't hear. He's just too wrapped up in the moment. But he starts doing it more severely. And you start to think to yourself, he doesn't seem like he's playing anymore. He seems like he actually wants to hurt. But he's like, is he laughing? He's kind of giggling. He is. It feels like some... Something else is making him go further than he should be going. He's here. not in control of himself. Exactly. And then it's like the, the girl shows up and it's like, your turn to hide. Right. She just gets taken up by these kids again. Like, oh, okay. she should be really disturbed. She should probably get in the carriage and go home because this guy, the, the little boy, was really hurting her. He yeah. could have even strangled her. But it's like she should have been an adult too and kind of like that's put enough the break on it. That's enough but for now. But they like kind of, they charm, they work on her and they're like, now it's your turn. You go hide. Okay, I'll go play too. Yeah. And she goes running off. Like you can see almost like a little girl. It's almost like she's been so cloistered her whole life. She's never really. That's a good point, John, because that's right. <clears throat> because now she's having a chance to just kind of just have reckless abandon. Yeah. She can just go she's play with the kids. She's never had that opportunity before. And so she goes running off. She goes down to basically the living room. There are many living rooms. Like a parlor. I think it's a parlor. So she goes down there and she's going to hide behind the curtains. Yes. But she sees her feet sticking out. So she. Beautiful. I just have to say, that one shot, she looks down and she sees her own feet coming out of the curtains. Just a little detail of that shot to think of it. Yes. So she sees her feet and she tucks them back in and gets behind these long curtains. The way it's framed, the, you have all this frame to work with. So yeah. she's behind the curtain. She's to the right of the frame. And then there's a space between the, the curtains where you can see outside. And we see this statue. He's Pan or a yeah. satyr or something. Yeah, yeah. So he's got, and got the little horn. So you know he's got a mischievous quality to him. And mostly it's dark shadows outside. Yeah. And from the dark shadows, and this is amazingly done. I just got the chills up my spine again. <laughs> The, these, this, it, from out of the dark shadows, in floats into the light outside the face of this man, the man we just saw like, in the photograph. Yeah, you know, not like boo ghost type. Of, he floats straight up, and you just catch his face in the light. It's so yeah. well timed and put together, and he starts coming toward the window. And she catches the attention out of her peripheral vision. Yeah, and he comes closer and closer and closer. It's Terrifying. In her reaction, she sees it, and it's just like... Abject terror. She just goes white. And what's interesting is the lighting on her... Yes, 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 yes. ...suddenly dim. Like, it she's does. caught in this he nightmare. He removes the light from it, her good face. Good point. Really nice. He overtakes it. Yes. He, like, takes all the light out of the Absolutely. scene. Absolutely. He's no right next to the glass. Special, no special effects. I think that's why it works so well. And her acting. Because you feel the terror. I mean, the way it's set up for this guy coming close. And this guy, and she's only got- We see it's the same guy guy. as the guy in the photo. And and right now at this point, he's so close to the glass, she's close enough to the glass. She's got, what, a quarter of an inch of glass? Yeah. An eighth of an inch of glass to separate her from this phantom, from this man, from this figure. And what's creepy about him is, in this shot here especially, he looks like every picture I can think of, of Lucifer. (laughs) <laughs> he has those angular cheekbones and yeah. that angular nose and this, this the tone of his face yeah. looks like it could be red because he's it's got black like and a white. beard, like a little bit of a beard, yes. and you can tell he's not like a, a wealthy guy or whatever. He's like a there, again, there's a class thing going on in this film. It's not overt, but he's clearly not upper class. And the sound suddenly drops, and you just hear his breathing. It's like this demonic breathing. And then what happens? He just disappears in the blackness. No and, expression change, <clears throat> nothing. And I mentioned this earlier. I just want to say this. Then when she's in the attic and she sees the photo, right? Because mm-hmm. you never know who he is until she sees that photo. Right. So again, it's this whole play between what's going on. Is it in her mind? But we see it. It's not like a fake ghost. And, it, and you could say, gee, is it in her mind? Because it could be. you just saw that photograph. Yeah. And it could be creepy because the creepy statues and the lighting. Maybe she's just imagining this thing. So Miss Giddens confronts Mrs. Gross about the man she's seen. And Mrs. Gross says that the man that she describes sounds like the master's valet. But, <laughs> but, but he's dead. 
uh, Miss Gross is trying to like, what did he look like? And she's like, he's like handsome, handsome and obscene. That's how she explains him. And she goes, she actually does then say, I know where I've seen him before. And she refers to the photo. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, after after Mrs. Gross is like, <laughs> yet he, but he's dead. He's dead. The kids appear over, over here and they're up on the landing of the stairway. And- they're laughing hysterically. Yeah. They like think down this is her. really funny. Laughing at her, not with her. So then the kids do the play. Right. And Miles, he's got this crown, he's holding this candle, and it's just this beautiful lighting effect on his face. Very theatrical. And he just looks so intelligent, yeah. Miles. And you know he's going to be very sophisticated, and he starts to to, to do this poem. I'm not going to do the whole poem now, but I, I just want to read a couple of lines, John. Go for it. Because, because these are the lines that really got to got under my skin. And he sings in this, this very proper British way. He even has a little bit of a lisp to it. It adds a little extra credence to it. And the whole thing is very Poe. Whom shall I love when the moon is arisen? Gone is my Lord, and the grave is his prison. What shall I say when my Lord comes a-calling? What shall I say when he knocks on my door? What shall I say when his feet enter softly, leaving the marks of his grave on my floor? Oh, boy. What's interesting here is, as he's reading this poem that is very chilling and far beyond what this little boy should be reading— the contrast between Miss Giddens and Mrs. Gross is so stark because <laughs> Miss Giddens is horrified, yeah. like we, the viewers, are. And Mrs. Gross is just sitting smiling. there smiling, going, oh, it. isn't he so sweet? <laughs> and then when he finishes the poem, he turns silently and mm. just stares at Miss Giddens, very much Village of the Damned like. Yeah, <laughs> he's got this very knowing. Oh my God! This very knowing smile, and it's chilling. You get the feeling he's calling out to Quint. Yes, absolutely. Obviously, absolutely. I mean, it's it's not it's not subtle in that way, but it's just, and you can see the look on Miss Giddens' face, like she's working up this whole thing in her head where these kids are being drawn to these this spirit, right? You know, for up to this point, we, we kind of get more of the connection between Miles and Quint. And now, suddenly, uh, we're out at this pond or lake. So we're at the gazebo. And it's clearly just like Giddens and Flora are just having a nice day. It's a nice summer day. In the gazebo. They're well-dressed and, and, and it's calm. And, and even Miss Giddens says, she goes, I'd say it's almost hot. And, and Flora says, I like it when it's hot. And she's over by the lake. And she asks Miss Giddens a question. She says, Miss Giddens, do tortoises swim? And she says, uh, no, dear, they can't swim. And Flora says, I didn't think so. And she takes the tortoise uh. out from the lake, <laughs> which is a really sadistic thing to do if she really has an inclination she to knew. do it. So you start to say to yourself, what's going on here? And then Miss Giddens looks over into the weeds, and there is... This figure of a woman in a black dress. Black that, dress. Very much that we saw dark, pass in front of that black hallway. black hair. I just got the chills. And she's standing there staring. And this is like at 30 Miss yards away. She's just like staring right back at them. Not moving a muscle. It's almost like a tin type in a sense. You know what I mean? Like that yes. kind of weird frozen moment. Frozen moment. Exactly. Frozen moment. She she's doesn't out in the move. middle of the lake. Yeah where nobody has any business being, in the middle of the lake, just staring at her. She's well-dressed. Well, think and about it. She can't even be there. It's reeds. She's in like, I think they call them bulrushes, actually. You couldn't, She's in these tall weeds. You can't stand on them. Yeah, it's like marsh. So she is staring at Miss Giddens. And Miss Giddens says, Flora, do you see that? It's, it's, it's terrifying. She's in the middle of the reeds like that. And you know what it reminds me of? Very much so. It reminds me of the first... Black Sabbath record <laughs> with the witch who's standing right there by the lake, the body of water with the oh, that, yeah. that barn or something in the background. It looks just like it to me. So even when I would see that on somebody's record collection, I go, oh, no, it's the innocence. Yeah. And then she asks Flora about it. She goes, Flora, do you see that? And then she looks up again and it's gone. she's gone. There's no one there. Right. 
It's like a cut, and you cut back, and she's gone. Right. And and of course, Flora doesn't know what she's talking about. Right. Um, well, Flora does know what she's talking about. But you don't know. <laughs> you like, don't know for sure. That's true. So she explains to Miss. Suddenly, she's back with Miss Gross, and she's like, "There's two of them." She calls them two of the abominations. Right. These two abominations. So she's taken up this. Suddenly, she feels like she's got this challenge now. These two figures. She, in her mind, are out to get the kids. Yes, They absolutely. want to take the kids. And it becomes this kind of, this battle in absolutely her head. Ba- it's absolutely a battle, yeah. You know, she's going to save these kids. She calls right. them the horrors. Yes. And in the typical Miss Gross manner, she she chooses every word very carefully and doesn't want to go beyond a certain thing. But we learn that Quint and Miss Jessel have a really twisted S and M like relationship. Yeah. And Quint is the master and she is the subordinate or the 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 slave. <laughs> well the words she she had no pride, no shame, Miss Jessel. Right. And she would crawl after him. Think about that. Like And he would hit her sometimes and it wasn't like she was hurt by it. She actually was yearning for the weight of his hand. But, so they have this twisted relationship that Miss Mrs. Gross doesn't really want to talk about, and it, this only disturbs even more Miss Giddens. And the other thing that Mrs. Uh, Gross <laughs> says is that they were doing things in the light of day in rooms that were meant for nighttime in a bedroom. As she says, used by daylight as if they were dark woods. What an image. How creepy is that? And... The children were watching this. The children are mimicking the things. So what's going on between the brother and sister? Yeah. Are they mimicking this sort of stuff? Well, it's funny. Miss Giddens, who's so horrified, she's like, they didn't care that you saw them? Like, No. And she's like, and the children? Yes. Like, she can't believe no. this. I just have to say that scene ends kind of with Miss Gross, a beautiful line. There were too many whispers in this house. And that's what it's all about. <laughs> and the whispers still go on. Yeah, the kids. You kind of get the sense the kids have this secret going on. Absolutely. They're not letting Miss Giddens in on it, obviously. No. She doesn't... They're keeping her away. There's a sequence at night. It's very dark. She has candlestick. And she's walking through the hallway. She was looking for Flora because Flora had disappeared, I believe. That's what it was. Well, she wakes up and, and Flora is not there right. in the bed. And she makes her way out to find out where Flora is. Yeah. And as she's walking around, we hear, once again, the sound design is amazing. Look at the frame. And this is one of those scenes where you see this effect where they did darken around her. It's almost like a vignette around her. It's a similar way that they used to do the matte paintings yeah. directly on glass. Exactly. And they would block out the frame. They would yeah. frame it with those, Im- the, with those they, pieces. <laughs> the candles, they... They put five wicks in each candle to, really to throw them. enough light. And it's not like uh, Barry Lyndon where they're just lighting up by candlelight. They didn't have quite have that technology with lenses. But the beautiful way the, the, the lighting is in these scenes, in you can see how they lit these hallways to make it look like it's just candlelight. But that's brilliant because it's you're, really getting, you're well using done. the light from the candlelight yeah. and you still get that flickering, like you said, flickering candle thing. And she's making her way around and the sound design is so beautiful and, 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 and gets underneath your skin because all these sounds are being heard. All these revelations about Quint <clears throat> and Miss Jessel. The children are watching. The children are <sighs> watching. And you get that Quint is up to whatever sexual escapades he is with the doors open. And Miss Jessel's not too cool about it. The children right. are watching. The children, And she says it enough times to say that Quint is just going at it and doing what he wants to do anyway. It's so <laughs> creepy, John, because you have all these dark hallways yeah. and these doors, and some open and some don't, but the voices are there. The voices are there. The voices are here. The voices are there. It's almost like they had, you know, quadraphonic sound or something, <laughs> you know? It's really incredible. And so she finally gets back to the bedroom after not finding Flora. And there's Flora. Flora's there at the window. At the window, again, where we saw her earlier, in looking the movie, down, into looking the down into the garden. Right. And and Miss Giddens runs up there, and and finally we see what she's looking at. Right. And there's Miles down in the garden, just looking up. 
And where's he looking? She looks where he's looking. It's almost like a Hitchcock scene. Right. Action, reaction. Right, right. And she looks up, and he's looking at the tower. In the garden there, there's a statue, and it's of a couple embracing. It looks kind of like Rodin's The Kiss. Right. So there's something tied to this garden and romance and other things that these kids are fascinated by. Yeah. Is that the place where they meet, you know, Miss Jessel and, and Quint, their spirits or something? Yeah, that, yeah. That's the way I looked at it, at yeah, least, yeah. you know. So she hustles Miles back to his bed. Right. The um, really disturbing part of this scene for me was it's time for Mrs. G- Miss Giddens to just basically tuck him in and that's that. Miles says to her, kiss me goodnight and he reaches around her in this romantic yeah. adult manner yep. grabs her behind the neck and pushes their faces together and he kisses her really hard on the mouth and you think what the heck is that and he's pressing against oh, her yeah. lips and Absolutely. you can see by her she's eyes she's trying to pull away she's but like he won't shocked. let her shocked and it uh, seems like he has more strength than this little boy does because and i and and that's what we're getting at here she finally pulls him away and he lays back on the pillow and he just gives her this he knowing smile right. at her like he knows right. it's a very strange He knows scene. that she knows that she was disturbed by that. And again, he's like 11. It's like the the dawn of puberty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like the way he tests things. The way he and, presses himself and does not let go and her horror yeah. is is really really telling. I don't think they had much of a rating system back then, but <laughs> no seriously, that scene caused this film in Britain to have an X rating. That's interesting, because it's a very disturbing scene to see a Just little boy scene. kiss a, a, a woman adult. on the mouth. Like and that. it's all about his intention, right? I mean, yes. kids... Parents kiss their kids on the mouth or whatever. But the intention in this is just so... Pure sexuality. Wow. It was a sexual intent. No (laughs) doubt about it. There is a lot going on in this movie. I just have to tell you. But it's the influence of Quint. Yeah. It's Quint's way of of just getting under her skin. Yep. And he's using the boy to do it. And then the next thing is this uh, scene where Miles is playing the piano. And he's, he's kind of distracting Miss Giddens. And then she looks, suddenly Flora is gone. And we find her at the gazebo again. So she's alarmed. She goes looking for Flora. And there she is by the gazebo. And she's and, dancing to the music box. And of course, the rain's what are you coming doing down here? by then. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? I always here? come here to dance, <laughs> to be alone. And what happens? She looks across the Miss Giddens. And you look across and, and you there's see Miss Jessel in the middle of the weeds with her black dress standing. Even spookier because you're looking through the raindrops. And this rain is coming down. It's and like she's a curtain. not moving a muscle. Oh she's just God. standing there like a statue and staring at Miss You know, Giddens. I'm at the bus stop in the rain. I can't <laughs> I can't move enough to get away from the raindrops. She's just dead still. Yeah, she's dead still, all right. <laughs> and I have to say, I don't know if this is intentional, Miss Giddens is also in a black dress. Yes, that's the first time we see it. Yeah. Exactly. It's weird, yes, like so. in this funeral dress in a way. Exactly. Like, what? It's beautiful. And she you confronts kind of Flora and she says, who is that person out there? She wants to make Flora say this name to release her from the control of right. this so, Miss Jessica. Exactly. In her the mind, power, the if power. she can get the kids to admit to seeing these specters, these ghosts, that's how she could break this possession. But unless she can get her to face it and name it, this influence will not go away. So she grabs Flora and she forces Flora to look. And she's hysterical at this She point. starts losing it. And here comes Mrs. Gross. And of to course- To screw it all up. <laughs> <laughs> let's just let's not talk about it uh, she holds her and comforts her and, and looks at miss giddens like what what is wrong with you what kind of a thing is that to do to a poor poor child and and flora just turns to to miss giddens and says i hate you i hate you i hate, I you. hate you and miss giddens says to mrs gross you saw it too yeah and she said i didn't see anything it, yeah. And I want to go over to Mrs. Gross and go, what are you talking about? Of course you saw that. Right there. No one sees her. <laughs> you don't see that every day, do you? <laughs> Too much dusting? But it's interesting how Miss Gross is kind of like, now you got to take her side too. You're like, what is this woman talking about? Yes. Like, It does give you that feeling at that moment in time. I have my point of view, but yeah. it does give you that feeling at that time that, wait a second, maybe that was really a cruel thing to do. Maybe... Maybe she really shouldn't have disturbed this poor little girl. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I don't feel that way, but it, it does leave enough of a question in you when you see her expression, Mrs. Gross. And she does it, once again, she's a terrific actress because yeah. she, she really walks the line the whole time with this kind of reality <laughs> and what you don't talk about. So now Miss Giddens, she's going to order Miss Gross to take Flora away from Bly to London. Right. She wants to be alone with Miles. Right. She's going to get to the bottom of this. Right. She's, she's certain Miles is on the brink of confessing. She wants to have this, basically the showdown. She wants to have Miles to herself so she can have him confront what's going on here and, and, the and look, release him. Right? But you can just tell by the look on her face is like, I do not like the way this is. I don't like, like this at all. Why didn't she say something? So we're left alone with, with Miss Giddens and Miles. And then we have that scene in the greenhouse where uh, they're talking at night and she questions him, why were you expelled from school? Well, to her, that's what like exactly? the kernel of a lot of things. Like, what went on at school? She's, she just wants to know. Go ahead. He gets pressed and goes back and forth, and his voice changes. I don't mean the actual voice itself, but the way the words are phrased and come out of his mouth, they, they change at different points in the sequence. Sometimes he really sounds like an adult and he has a very sophisticated snooty mouth. Right, right. And other times he's just a little boy. So you can feel the pull of this spirit of Quint in him pushing back, yeah. pushing back. And finally she gets Miles to admit that he said things probably in Quint's words, and hurt things like something Quint might hurt at the school and that it disturbed and frightened the other boys. This is a classic wide shot again where the Miles is in the foreground on mm -hmm. the right, I believe, and she's in the background. Mm -hmm. They're both in focus. Yep. It's kind of like a metaphor, like they're, they're far apart, but in this scene, they're very close the way the focus is. It's, right. it's a really nice watch. That's, that, that's a good point. Yeah, absolutely. And, and she wants to know, when did you first see and hear such things? Shall I tell you who taught you these things? And then we see in the window to the left of Miles, Quint's face staring in angry. It's not that clear because... The, the window is, is fogged because it's warm in the greenhouse. So he comes up and you see this this kind of ghostly image right. of Quint's face looking basically over Miles' shoulder over as shoulder. she's talking to Miles. He can't really express what it is he's trying to say. And then she says, shall I tell you who taught you these things? So she literally has him backed up against the wall. But basically, he starts screaming at her. He calls her a, hussy. a damned hussy, a damned dirty hag. I knew you as soon as you got here. I could tell you, you're not fooling anybody. He really unloads on her. And it, these are words coming directly from, from Quint, Quint into his mouth. And then he starts to laugh. And you see Quint laughing at the same time. So you can see who's pulling the strings of this marionette. And then finally, Miles can't take it anymore. He, he has the tortoise in his hand, Rupert, and he throws it to the glass. It kind of breaks the spell and he runs out into, into the garden. It's a section of the garden. It kind of reminded me of like a Roman gladiator. Yeah, yeah. They're a all, circle right. of some sort where, and, and these statues are standing with It looks like an arena. Arena, or exactly. It's small, but that's how the hedge is made out to be. And now this is where the battle's going to be right. won or lost. So she, she chases him, catches him in the middle of this garden. The camera kind of twirls at one point. You see all these statues. The camera works amazing. Yeah. And then suddenly. Up on a pedestal is Quint. Right. It's such a great shot. Uh, yes. Another great shot. And his hand is, is, is in the left-hand corner of the frame, and it looks almost like claws or something. He's, he's ready to pounce on yeah. them. It's almost like Quint is reaching out for Miles. Now, I'm going to stop you here. Okay. Because we think you should see it for yourself. There is a, a really nifty ending to it that we're going to leave <clears throat> the viewer to... Uh, to see for themselves. Yeah, it's it's so good a film. We want to entice you to see it. We employ you. Um. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. It's a great, great film. Go see it. Well, that's all the time we have this week. We'd like to thank our friend Glenn Ornowitz for his music. And of course, our listeners for tuning in. So join us next week for another episode of Film Detour. 
If you like our show, please recommend us to your friends. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play, and leave a review. Go to our website at filmdetourpodcast.com to leave comments or email us with questions. You can also visit us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter.